Acts chapter 12. This is what it says. It was about this time that King Herod arrested someone who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. Ooh, that's a good reminder that most times the need for approval precedes bad intentions. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread, and after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers. Quick math, what is that? Fantastic, okay. You had your coffee. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. And so Peter was kept in prison, but the church. Everyone say, but the church. But the church. Come on, everyone say, but the church. But the church, Ooh, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up. Come on, look at that, right? You got a light, an alarm clock, and a swift kick to the kidneys. That's how you get someone up, okay? If you ever needed an idea on how to wake up a teenager, there you go. The Bible has everything, okay? And he said, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. And they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city and it opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. And then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt, everyone say without a doubt, without a doubt. that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Three more verses. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. And when she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Here's what I want to do for the next few moments. I want to focus on verse 11. It says, then Peter came to himself. In the New Living Translation, it says, then Peter came to his senses. I want to title my message today, Come to Your Senses. Come to your senses. God, I pray that you would bless these next few moments. Help us to receive, help us to understand, help us to comprehend. We're so grateful for your Father. We need your Son, and we're thankful for your Holy Spirit. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Come to your senses. How many of you have siblings? Anyone have siblings? Um, okay, so I've got four kids, and my oldest is 16. The next oldest is seven. Here's the deal. They've got an interesting relationship. Okay, it's very interesting. Um, but whenever things are going well, they like to wrestle, which is so backwards to me. But it is what it is, okay? They love it. They love to wrestle. Now, my 16-year-old doesn't really care about wrestling, but he knows that my seven-year-old absolutely loves it. And all he ever wants to do is to beat Brody, okay? That's all Genesis wants to do. He's like, I'm going to beat you. I'm going to take you out. You're done. Seven years old. Just imagine that, okay? Now, you got to imagine this amount of energy right here that's happening, okay? Imagine that in a two-foot body. That is my seven-year-old, okay? That's Genesis, all right? So he's wild. And um, we have a rule in our house that anytime we wrestle, if you hurt Genesis, you have to wrestle daddy, now, here's the deal. I know I'm looking tall, lanky like Kevin Durant over here, but let me tell you something. I got dad strength, okay? And so as big as he gets, I don't care how big as he gets, I'm going a, I'm to a, a beat him, okay? Not in an abusive way. I'm just going to let him know, okay? Just, just letting you know. Don't clip that. Okay, here's the deal. 
So, so that's the rule. You, you can't hurt Genesis, okay? And so they're wrestling, and um, uh, never once has Genesis ever won, okay? He doesn't do that, okay? We need to pray for him, okay? We need to pray. I mean, come on. The dude's the, the seven. You saw how cute he was. And like, not once will he let him win. I'm just like, just let him win, bro. Just let him, just tap out. He's like, nah, I ain't gonna do it. <laughs> you know? And, and it does, every time, every single time, I've yet to see a win. And um, there was a day um, that uh, he, they were wrestling multiple times. And he was just trying to win, just trying to win. And Brody, after each win, would be like, like give him almost like a, like a teaching moment. Like give him a lesson of life, you know? You know, so the first, first time he beats him, he's like, yeah, hey, bud, it is what it is. <laughs> Deal with it. He's like, what? What are you talking about, <laughs> right? <laughs> At this time, he's like five and doesn't know any of this stuff. The next time, he's like, hey, yep, suck it up. <laughs> suck it up. Life ain't fair. <laughs> suck it up, right? <laughs> and then, and then uh, one, one of my favorite ones was uh, uh, wrestled him, beat him again. He goes, hey, man, sometimes you just got to roll with the punches. <laughs> 16 years old. Right now, this was a couple years ago. So anyways, either, either way. And there was one time they started wrestling. They get so crazy. I said, look, you got to take it upstairs. Y'all go wrestle. But Brody, you better be careful. Don't hurt Genesis. It's like, all right, yeah, go upstairs. They start wrestling. Three minutes later, you just hear it. Yeah! I was like, oh, my gosh. What is happening? Genesis is coming down, and he's holding his arm. Dad, Brody hurt me. And I said, well, we know the rule in the house, don't we? He's like, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, say it. Say it, Daddy. <laughs> I'm like, go get Brody. It's time to wrestle. Immediately, he's like, Brody! <laughs> Not holding his arm, nothing. I'm like, did I just get punked by my five-year-old? Like, what is going on? He's like, Brody, you need to come down. Uh, you're wrestling daddy. Brody, coming in. Like, just with like, like, y'all know what I mean? Like, just, what's up, dad? Let's do this. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. 15 seconds, I had him tapped, okay? It was done. I don't want to embarrass him. But 15 seconds, I had him tapped, okay? And uh, it was the greatest thing I've ever seen the moment afterwards. I do it. You know, Genesis is cheering. He's on the ottoman. He's like, yeah, get him, daddy. Brody's like, you know, a little ashamed. Like, dang, I thought I could be able to have him. Like, ah, oh. he starts walking off. And Genesis goes, hey, Brody. Hey. He's like, what's up, bud? He goes, sometimes you just got to roll with the punches. <laughs> Five years old. Just got to roll with the punches. Have you ever been in a season of life where you feel like you're just rolling with the punches? Right? This is Peter. Peter is just trying to get a win. Right? It's like he's Genesis. Like, can I just get one win? I just get one, like, like, come on, like something. Right? And this man is having to roll with punch after punch after punch. And I'm feeling for my guy Peter because... His life is completely littered with teaching moments throughout Scripture, okay? This, this is so, so huge. First, he, he's learning how to walk on water. He does it, but then kind of, you know, falls. And then he's denying Christ, okay? And now this man is seized. He's arrested. His friend James died. He's put into prison, okay? He's guarded by 16 soldiers, and now he's on trial, okay? This man is going through it. So you know that Peter's got his doubts. Anyone ever doubted before? Oh, y'all better polish your halos real quick and raise your hand. You ever doubted before? I've been there. But one thing that we find out that Peter is really good at is this man knows how to roll with the punches. So how do I begin to roll with the punches with doubt in my face? How, how do I begin to do this? Do I, have you ever asked the question, do I have what it takes? Can, can, I, can I actually make it through this? Like, this is going to be the thing that actually takes me out. Do I actually have what is inside of me? And I think verse 5 is a great starting point, and I would say is also my first point. One of the first things that you have to do in order to roll with the punches is you've got to remember the church. Everyone say, remember the church. 
verse five, it says, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. This is so important because earnestly means to intensely seek after God. Right? Like, when is the last time that you've intensely sought after the Holy Spirit? It says earnestly praying to God. This is why I love churches like Hope City and pastors like Daniel and Jackie. I mean, it, it, they are providing spaces and places for you to, to fast and pray. I'm going to pray with y'all. I might not fast. I'm going to pray about fasting. Right? <laughs> what are they doing? They're creating moments for you to intensely seek after God so that when you go through hell, right, you have things to look back at and go, ooh, God was faithful then. And that's what builds your faith. Amen? This is huge. And, 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 and when you're able to do that, you can begin to roll with the punches a lot easier. The truth of the matter is that if we forget the importance of the church and try to use it as jewelry as opposed to oxygen, the way that it was intended to be, right? We, we will use the church just to enhance our lives when the fact of the matter is, is that it was supposed to be our life, right? Can I be honest with you? Some of you think that church has become your lifestyle, but you've talked yourself out of serving, Right, like you think church is a lifestyle, it's more than a Sunday, but you've inched your way out of leadership. Like, like you said, no, 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 church is our, our family, thing. It's, it's, it's our lifestyle, this is the thing that we're gonna do, but you rolled your way out of bed one time a month rather than four times a month. Have you ever been there? And if we aren't careful, we will forget the power of the church, right? I, we've got to intensely seek after God. And here's the deal. You can get upset with me because I leave next week. I'm gone. I won't be here, right? But, but here's what I believe is that if you're not vocal about it and it ain't visible, then it ain't a value to you in your life. Right, so you've gotta remember the church. Everyone say, remember the church. If you wanna roll with the punch as well, which leads me to my second point, remember your humanity. Ha <laughs> ha ha, ooh man, if we all need the first point, the church, we all have the second point, our humanity. Tell your neighbor, I'm not God. Ooh, pride broken down, did y'all see that? That was crazy, look at your second choice. Tell them, I'm just human. I'm just human. Human, verse seven, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell and he struck Peter on the side, woke him up, quick, get up. And he said, the chains fell off of Peter's wrist. Listen to this, verse eight. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And then Peter did that. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. And Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea what the angel was doing, that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. So they passed the first gate. And they passed the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left them. Could you imagine Peter in this moment? Chains off. Could you imagine the, uh, uh, like, uh, the amount of doubt that he had? Even in the midst of the chains falling off. He'd be like, okay, now what? <laughs> How am, I, how am I gonna get out? How am I gonna get past these guards? How am I get, where, where do I even go? I don't even know where I'm at. Could you amount, like, imagine the, 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 the confusion that he had? Right, the, the, the amount of questions that he was probably circling through. Like, the amount of insecurities. Like, wait, is this, is this really happening? Is it not happening? It says he, he didn't even know what was actually happening. The amount of anxiety or worry or pause. He, he felt out of control. And I look at this passage and I'm like, why can't I get a step-by-step -step playbook? Do you ever wish that sometimes? Like, I just, I would like a step-by-step. -step. I mean, literally, this is it. <laughs> Showed him what to do every step of the way. I can't get out of a parking violation, but this man gets out of a first-class ride out of prison. 
You know what I'm talking about? Like, that's crazy. It's the wildest things. But sometimes angels will do things for people that people can't do for themselves. Look at it. It says the angel made Peter's chains fall off, but he told Peter to put his clothes and sandals on by himself. Then it says the angel led Peter through the locked doors, past the guards, and through an iron gate, but he still expected Peter to walk on his own two feet. Then the angel took Peter down one street and then left him alone to use his own wits. So at the same time that I just said my last phrase, you've got this other one. Don't expect angels to do for you what you can do for yourself. Right? This, this, I, I, I'm trying to get you to see yourself in Peter, okay? He had all the same questions, all the same thoughts, all the same realities, right? And Peter gets it wrong, right? Gets it right, gets it wrong. He thought this whole thing was a vision. Wrong, it was a miracle, right? Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. And it, it says in verse 11, it says, then Peter came to himself, or in the New Living Translation, then Peter came to his senses. Now I know that without a doubt, the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. Now I know without a doubt. Can you think of a time when you have experienced without a doubt? Without a doubt. Everyone say without a doubt. This is a different kind of statement, right? Without a doubt, like, like you have to remember, like without a doubt, in essence, can just mean with faith. Ha ha ha! Oh, you better wake up. Without a doubt, in essence, can just mean with faith or with full assurance of faith, right? Hebrews 11.1, 1. faith is the confidence in what we hope for and for the assurance of things unseen. So now the question isn't, can you live without a doubt? Because Peter already tells us that we can, right? Okay, the question is, do you know how to identify without a doubt? Ah, let me teach Bible real quick. Are you ready? I'm about to help you identify the concept of without a doubt or with faith. Are you ready? Everyone in the room watching online, and unless you're on a car, in a car, don't do this, but everyone stand up. Are you ready? Here it goes. Sit down. It's not a trick. You can just sit down. Did you see it? Not for one second did you question whether or not that chair was going to hold you. Not for one second did you go, uh, does it have four legs? Shaking it. No one did that. No one did that. You sat right there. Just, okay, this is stupid. Youth pastors. <laughs> and I, what am I doing? <laughs> Think about it. The amount of faith you just put in that chair. Scripture says that all you need is the faith of a mustard seed. So why does it? When it comes to the creator of the world, we start questioning everything. Like, wow, well, that doesn't make any sense. What are you talking about? I'm not talking about weak faith versus strong faith. I'm talking about where you put your faith in or who you put your faith in because every single one of you just put faith in a chair. You did. You literally did. But then we're like, ah, no, I need more faith. No, 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 no. A mustard seed. If I, if I had a mustard seed right here, you would not be able to see it. Exactly. The majority of you didn't even see the faith that you put into that chair. And that's all that he asks for. Right? Faith. Woo! <laughs> faith begins with you. It begins with you. Everyone say I. That's why I is in the middle of faith. Okay? It, it, it begins with you. And what you've got to understand is that when you look at this scripture, without a doubt, actually only happens in hindsight. Without a doubt happens in hindsight. When he goes to the house, 
and the church is meeting in the house, it says that they thought it was Peter's angel after he had died knocking on the door. What are we talking? How wild is that? Like we will believe something even crazier just to not give God the glory. Like there's no way that that's Peter. No, nope, it must be his angel. Really, have you ever said that before? Because that's crazy. Isn't that the wildest thing? It's like my, my pastor says, you can, you can call it coincidence or you can give God the credit. credit. Either way, God did it. I'm here to tell you that your doubts are not a disqualification to your faith. And some of you have walked in here and you're like, oh, I'm doubting, I'm worrying. It's okay. It's fine. That doesn't mean God, can, God can't use you. It just means, oh, now God can use you. This is huge. Because the fact of the matter is, is that you will look out of your mind when you have faith. And when you live without a doubt, Verse 16 says, but P Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished, which leads me to the final point. If you wanna be able to roll with the punches, you gotta remember the church, you gotta remember your humanity, and the third one, you have to remember to keep going. Peter kept on knocking on that door, even after a road ahead answered the door and left him to go tell the church their prayers had been answered. He kept on knocking. Right? He insisted on knocking. When they insisted, nope, he's dead. See, everything begins to align with the Holy Spirit when you operate in full assurance and without a doubt. Now, here's what you have to understand. I want to put a disclaimer here. Is that several times in the Bible, it actually states that belief, everyone say belief. Belief, belief is an essential step in receiving a positive answer to prayer. Right, Matthew, 1, or Matthew 21, 22, it says, Jesus told the disciples, and whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive, if you have faith. And I love when people take that out of context, and they're like, well, I'm just gonna get everything I want then. This doesn't mean that you can just receive anything that you want if you just have enough faith, because you'll have to continue to read the Bible. And in 1 John 5, 14, it says, we must also pray according to God's will. And so in this case, Peter's release is in God's plan, right? But the church members don't realize this until they go look at the gate, right? Even the church had doubts, right? Because it says that, that the church was actually meeting in this, in this praying for him. Even the church had doubts until they went to the gate and looked. Your doubts in life ensure that God gets the credit and the glory for everything that is about to happen. And some of you are in a situation and it looks bleak. Some of you are in a situation, you're like, there's no way I can get out of it. Some of you are just like praying, man, I hope these chains fall off. I, I hope I can get rid of this addiction. I hope I can turn the corner. I hope my kids will be okay a decade from now. I hope that this is happening. And, and, and you've doubted and doubted and doubted and worried and you've had panic attacks and you have anxiety and you're going through life and you're like, God, can you help me? I'm gonna tell you, for some of you, God's been knocking and you just need to go to the gate and look. You're saying, I'm waiting, I'm praying, I'm hoping. And Peter's at the door, like, nah, that ain't Peter. Nah, that must be his angel. Even if it was his angel, I'm still going. Does that make sense? But that's what we do with God. Like, Lord, please help me. Nah, I'm good. Lord, please. Help me! Why are they distracting me? I'm good. Lord, please! Right? And then we get the same result every single time. And, and here's the deal. You, you, you weren't able to roll with the punches beforehand. You weren't able to roll with the punches in life before because you were doing it on your own. You were doing it on your own. One of my favorite statements that my pastor has ever said, it stuck with me for 
so long. He says the only way to truly fail is to quit. Peter, in this moment, does not do that. Doesn't quit. I'm here to let you know that there's many people in this room, many people watching online, maybe you've been wondering if it's time to, to quit. You're like, I can't get a win. I, I, can't, I can't move forward. It's not gonna happen. It's just one thing after another. And as the band comes to play, it's just one thing after another, after another, after another. After another. You're like, gosh, I'm coming in this morning. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay. God, speak to me. Speak to me. There's a lot of value in understanding that these moments right here where we gather collectively, so much power. So much power in moments like this. And here's the deal. I want to challenge you this fall as you're heading into a new series, heading into this 21 days of prayer and fasting. Sunday is not a moment for you to hear from God. Sundays are a moment for him to confirm and affirm everything he's already been telling you throughout the week. You know how much, how much life, how life-giving that is? Not just walking in here depleted, but you're leaving. Don't I sound somewhat spiritual now? <laughs> walking in here depleted, and that's never the way God intended it to be. He said, no, I want to speak to you all the time. Every day of the week, every moment, every hour. And so we've got to remember to give control. We are not God. We are human. We will fail just like Peter did. But man, I want moments like that to happen. He followed the angel. I want you to follow the angel. I want to follow the angel. We were singing, make me a vessel. Oh, nearly started crying because that's, my, that's been my prayer the last six weeks. Lord, I just want to be a vessel. Forget money, forget fame, forget all that stuff. I'm, no, I don't want any of it. I just want to be a vessel, a vessel because that is the most rewarding thing in life. The longer that you do life, the more you realize just being a vessel for God to operate through and to flow through, whoo, there ain't nothing like it. And then you have to remember to keep going. Never quit. Never give up. I'm not saying you can't rest. I'm not saying you can't be down. But you better have some things in place. A community in place. A church in place. Mentors in place. Ready for when you do go down so that you can stand right back up. For the next few moments, if I could have everyone stand, I want to give people the opportunity to come into a right relationship with Jesus Christ, whether you're watching online, part of our H crew, or, or Katie, Katie location, or Woodlands location. Here's the deal. I believe that this is one of the most important moments right here. One of the most important moments of the week. And for many of you, you've already made a decision to come into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And what am I saying when I say that? I'm saying, you're saying that Jesus is the center of everything, not your first priority, the center of everything. That means everything flows from the Father. Everything flows from the Holy Spirit. Everything flows from the Son. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to pray this prayer. And for, and for the benefit of those who are praying it for the very first time, I want you to say it along with me. Say, Dear Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for who the Bible says that you are. I believe that you died on the cross. You rose from the grave, defeating all sin, defeating all shame. Come into my life. Make me a new creation. And I will follow you all the days of my life. 